All right, hello everyone. My name is Carly Graves and I am a first year master's student in the bio and ag engineering department at NC State. And this is my first major conference as a student. So I'm excited to be here and thank you guys for coming to this presentation. Um, so I worked with my advisor who is the leader of this session and helped with a project trying to figure out the impact of sludge on nutrient concentrations in the effluent or supernatant of swine lagoons. Okay, so just want to set the stage by talking about the significance of the swine industry in North Carolina. So it's our second largest agricultural commodity at almost $2 billion. We're the third largest producer in the U.S. We have a 9 million head inventory and push out almost 19 million finished pigs per year and about 2,400 swine operations. And you can see on this map here where swine operations are mainly concentrated in the state of North Carolina, so more towards the coast. And the primary manure management system that we have for swine operations are anaerobic lagoons. So not just storage, but also for treatment. And these lagoons, so manure is flushed from the barn. We have the solids that settle and accumulate in the bottom of the lagoon. So that's our accumulated sludge. We have our permanent liquid treatment zone. And this is where active my microbial communities are and where the treatment is occurring. We have our temporary liquid storage zone. So this, falls in between, you can see on there, the start and stop pumps. Those are two important markers for this study that I'm gonna be talking about. And so this is where you're typically irrigating between, is between the start and stop pump. And then above that start pump is what we consider all of our safety rainfall factor or freeboard. And it's important to note too, that a lot of North Carolina um, lagoons or swine lagoons were not, were built prior to this sludge storage zone being a required component. And so, because of that, you know, a lot of our lagoons are taking up more than their sh fair share of treatment volume. And because of that, the, the solids are also taking up room that otherwise would be available for freeboard and rainfall storage. And so that becomes a factor because we're also seeing increasing rainfall trends in Eastern North Carolina. So this is from Clinton, Clinton, North Carolina. And for the past 15 years, you can see this kind of steady increase in annual rainfall by almost one and three quarter inches per year. And on top of that, we're also seeing a lot more frequent hurricanes and really large storm events. So you guys are probably familiar with some of these images. We get a lot more of this. So here's a couple images. The first one is um, from Hurricane Florence in 2018, where you can see the breach lagoons, the effluent made their way all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, another one, Hurricane Matthew in 2016, breach lagoons, again, causing a lot of problems. And so we know this causes issues for animal mortality, for human health, environmental impacts, but also just really bad PR for the industry. Like these are some of the first images that will come up if you just search swine lagoons on the internet. So before anything about design criteria, you're getting images about all the terrible things associated with them. So what tools do we have to prevent this from happening? Well, we call that drawdown. So we already talked about between that start and stop pump um, is where we're typically irrigating. Drawdown is what we consider any lowering of the lagoon below that stop pump. And drawdown is not a negative thing. It can, it's a great tool that we have to be able to um, combat you know, the potential for large, when we have incoming large storm events. Um, but there are some things to take into consideration with this. So here's a couple of the main compliance um, compliances that we have for North Carolina lagoons. So the first one is a state Senate bill. And so it's saying that of that storage volume, 50% of that must be sludge free. And this was um, put in place to account for the fact that, again, a lot of our lagoons don't have that sludge factor built into them. Um, so just trying to make sure that we're not sacrificing treatment volume for and allowing sludge to accumulate. And so the second one is a retired NRCS standard that has continued to stay a part of North Carolina lagoon permitting. And so this says that during the months of June, July-ish to September, so during our hurricane season, lagoons can be drawn down or lowered six inches below the stop pump as long as you have 48 inches between the top of your sludge and your lagoon level. And it's important to note too that both of these, we don't really know the basis for why they, you know, the numbers are somewhat arbitrary. Like we don't really know why the rule is 48 inches. So part of our study is looking into 
are these valid assumptions and do we need to change any of these going forward for um, lagoon management? So here's some of our research questions for this study. So first, how often are lagoons exceeding that maximum freeboard level? Because of course, more often we're above our freeboard, the more likely it is that we're gonna be breaching our lagoon. Um, secondly, how many farms are meeting the sludge accumulation guideline? So again, that's going back to that, leaving 50% of your treatment volume available for treatment or sludge free. And then the third question we're trying to answer is does the treatment volume available have an impact on the quality of the effluent during that drawdown? So we were really fortunate to have a large data set for this study, and this was provided by Smithfield Foods. So we were able to analyze 27 lagoons over the course of six years, so from 2015 to 2020, we had 11 finishing farms and 17 sow farms. And for each of those farms, we had weekly free board readings, annual sludge surveys, and a little less than monthly um, lagoon supernatant or effluent nutrient concentrations. So that's giving us a total of about 1,300 sample points. And I just want to emphasize again that this, this is an enviable amount of data that we have to be able to follow the same lagoon through these you know, through six years is, is very significant. But to be able to compare 27 different lagoons with their all of their own different dimensions and um, designs, we needed to come up with ways to normalize the data we were looking at. So we came up with two different ratios. So the first one is our freeboard ratio. And so this is basically trying to figure out where in relation to our start and stop pumps is our lagoon level falling. And so just keep in mind for both of these that measurements are taken from the top of the lagoon down. And so freeboard ratio we calculated as the distance between the freeboard and the start pump divided by the difference between the start and stop pump for our temporary storage zone. And so in this case, a high freeboard ratio was indicating that our liquid level was close to our sludge level. So we had a, a lower lagoon level. Second one was our sludge level ratio. So Again, we're trying for this. We were trying to compare what percent of our of our storage and treatment volume is um, filled with sludge, and so we calculated that by taking the sludge level minus the stop pump divided by half of our treatment depth divided or minus our stop pump. And so, in this case, a high sludge level ratio indicated that the sludge was far from the liquid level, so our sludge level was low. So now moving on to the results. So here's a distribution of how the freeboard ratio came out. So we see that two thirds of our cases were falling above that stop pump. So either in our, um, our temporary storage area or in our freeboard. And it's good for us to see too that only about 2% were falling in that um, freeboard zone, which you know we're trying to avoid that. That's increasing the risk of, of breaching. And so better to stay in our storage zone. And then we see that about a third of our data points fell when lagoon levels were into the treatment zone. So there's a potential here to be, you know, that to sacrifice treatment depth, but this doesn't tell us the whole story alone. We still don't know um, in relation to where the sludge is um, how much how much treatment volume we have available. But it is telling us though that farmers are taking advantage of this drawdown. So about a third of the year. June, July-ish to September is our hurricane season where, where you're allowed to draw down six inches below the stop pump. So this shows us that people are taking advantage of that rule for sure, about one third of the year. So here's the distribution for the sludge level ratio. And so you see that 62% um, of our data points did not need sludge removal. But you do see that this the, um, the peak is just over one, a sludge level ratio of one, indicating that they are approaching needing sludge removal. And then you see 38% um, are in a position where they need to cope with a plan for sludge removal already. So here we see a distribution for who would technically be in compliance or allowed to draw down um, for, you know, during that hurricane season. And we see that only about a third of the farms do have that eight that capability and about two thirds don't have that necessary depth to be able to draw down. And so if we go back and compare that to our freeboard, excuse me, where about a third were also um, in that drawdown area, 
in about a third year have the ability to. Whenever farmers have the ability to, they're taking advantage of it and they're drawing down to avoid the risk. So kind of comparing these two together, we're most worried about the situation where lagoons are in drawdown and where sludge removal is needed. Because that means our sludge levels are high and our liquid levels are low, and there's gonna be a higher chance that in drawdown or um, in land applying, that some of the solids from the sludge are gonna make their way into the effluent and we're gonna be applying excess nutrients. So this is the case that we're most, most concerned about. But moving on to the nutrient concentrations, we did analyze that for the entire data set. So you see here, we analyzed for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, and copper. Um, and the bars are showing the mean concentrations. We have the error bar and then showing you the maximum values. So the first thing that we were interested in is what is the variability from the mean value to the maximum? And so right off the bat, we see that nitrogen and potassium, so nitrogen from three and a half to 21, about six or seven times the variability. Potassium, seven to 17, a little more than two times. So we're not so worried about that. We're not seeing any variability that's crazy. And most importantly, we're already applying at nitrogen rates. So we don't need to worry about our nitrogen concentrations as much. That brings our attention to phosphorus, zinc, and copper. And we know that those are bound in the solid form and those are bound in the sludge. And so for phosphorus, we're seeing 0.8 to 58, somewhere on the order of like 60 or 70 times the variability. Zinc, it's like 160 times. Copper is like 120. So we're seeing about two orders of magnitude difference there. So that's pretty significant. And again, this makes sense knowing that they're bound in the sludge because there's a higher chance that when we're in drawdown or when our lagoon levels are lower, that some of the solids are gonna be making their way into our effluent. And it's not like a linear increase for the concentration in the supernatant to the sludge. It's a drastic jump once you get into the, um, the sludge nutrient concentrations. And it's important to note too that zinc, you know, is fed in high concentrations for um, growing pig diet. And so those are found in really high concentrations. We know phosphorus obviously is a nationwide global concern. So we went, continued forward with phosphorus and zinc analysis. And because the spread was so large, we did have to take a log transform to really see some noticeable differences. And when we did, we see that for phosphorus, when lagoons are in drawdown, we see about an 11% increase in phosphorus content. And you can also see for the drawdown category, we have more of our outliers and extreme values. So again, this goes back to the idea that in drawdown or um, taking samples closer to the sludge levels, higher chance that we're gonna be sampling high concentrations of nutrients. Then for the sludge level ratio, we see less of an impact. So about a 3.2% increase um, for in phosphorus when sludge removal is due. And for this case, we see kind of an equal, you know, the outliers are kind of somewhat equal in both categories. So we're not seeing one condition um, give us a lot more variability than the other. Same kind of trends are present for zinc. So for zinc, when we're in drawdown, we're seeing about an 18% increase in zinc concentrations. Um, and again, more of the outliers and spread are occurring during the drawdown. And for sludge level, when sludge removal is due, we're seeing about a 1.2% increase. So this kind of tells us that on its own, sludge level versus freeboard level, freeboard has a much greater impact than sludge level but we wanted to see what the coupled effects were of these interactions. So we took for phosphorus and zinc, did analysis for each of the four conditions for each nutrient. And despite the trends that we saw for um, freeboard being more impactful than sludge, when coupled, we saw significant, statistically significant differences for phosphorus while we did not for zinc. That was kind of interesting to note. And for phosphorus, it still was a pretty small um, difference. So what are, some of our what are some of our main conclusions? So, you know, we did notice that zinc, copper, and phosphorus, we know those are bound into the solids and into the sludge. And so it was, you know, it confirms that when we're in drawdown or when our lagoon levels are low, yes, there's a higher chance of drawing high concentrations of these nutrients. It also showed, that, showed us that on its own, freeboard played a more significant role in supernatant phosphorus and zinc compared to sludge. 
like compared to the, um, the sludge level. And remember back, it also showed us that um, farmers and growers really are taking advantage of this drawdown rule. And when they have the ability to draw down, you know, they're aggressively managing their lagoons to avoid risk of breaching. So what are some of the next steps? So kind of becomes a question, it's a double-edged sword. You're weighing, you know, are we gonna prevent lagoon breaching or are we gonna prevent applying excess nutrients? And the answer to that is pretty easy. I mean, of course, the financial repercussions of breaching are far outweigh um, applying some extra phosphorus, um, but still becomes a management strategy for whoever's you know, managing the lagoon. Also, this was just a first pass at a, a very large data set. So there's still a lot more ways that we could spin this. Like we had a whole set of irrigation data and we started to look in a little bit into the seasonality effects um, of the time of year that we're irrigating and how that impacts the sludge level and lagoon level. Um, so there's a lot of a lot more that can be done with this data set. And lastly, you know, this is kind of off the distance, but ideally, you know, down the road, this will help provide information to policymakers. So the two regulations that I brought up in the beginning, again, those we don't really know the basis for some of those numbers. You know, is it 48 inches? Is it 36? Like we don't really know. So hopefully, this will help guide some of those decision making and help us um, have more concrete answers to these questions and less arbitrary. Um, regulations. And again, just want to give acknowledgement to Smithfield for providing this data set and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm.